Hello, welcome back to EE for Everyone. Today we're going to talk about circuit protection. This is a very big topic, and I know that we can get a little distracted here. Like last week, we ended up talking about my neighbor's dog. After a while, we got into talking about the wasp in my house. Pit stop on the road. Let's get to the point. If we have a microcontroller operating at 3.3 or 5 volts, and it's controlling some stuff that's operating at 24 or 48 volts, how can we make sure that the microcontroller never gets damaged by the higher voltage it's controlling? That's a tricky question, and it really depends on the situation. Sometimes the answer is simple, and sometimes it isn't. For this discussion, let's assume we're talking about slow signals and reasonable voltages. When a company makes a microcontroller, they're pretty smart and plan on their device surviving a reasonable amount of abuse. Sometimes things happen. ESD can cause a circuit to misbehave or inject current into a pin of a microcontroller. Manufacturing defects can cause a net to have more voltage on it than was originally intended. There are a multitude of ways that overvoltage conditions can occur at a pin of a microcontroller. Because of this, nearly every pin of a microcontroller has integrated protection diodes clamping the input pin or output pin to VCC and ground such that negative voltages or excessive voltages applied to a microcontroller input will not damage the device. This protection has its limits though. The currents at play need to be pretty small. These input protection diodes aren't rated for much power dissipation if they're rated at all and shouldn't be relied on for the normal operation of a circuit. Relying on the protection diodes of a microcontroller for proper circuit function is kind of like using lift cables in an elevator that aren't rated for dynamic loading. You can do it, and it might be fine, but I wouldn't want to be in that elevator. I think of these diodes as a last resort, where there should be at least one failure in a system before these input protection diodes would carry any current. I typically design my system such that there would need to be two failures in a system before a microcontroller input protection diode would carry any current. A great example of this is what we did to protect the pins of the microcontroller that control the LED drivers in the plant light project. If I'm doing my job right, you should see this schematic now. Schematic please? No? What kind of a... Please excuse me for a moment while I share a few words with the editor. Ah, much better. We have our schematic. Let's think about what's happening here. This is a simplified schematic showing a representation of the output of a microcontroller, which is tied to the base of a transistor which is biased by the current flowing from the 24 volt rail through a resistor when the 5 volt rail has not yet turned on. If the microcontroller pin is high impedance, the voltage at the base of the transistor is the forward voltage of the base emitter junction diode, and the enable signal is low. This 0.7 volts is perfectly safe for the microcontroller if it were connected. When the microcontroller pulls this pin low, the base drive current is diverted through the microcontroller pin and the transistor turns off. However, if the microcontroller were to assert the pin high or apply 5 volts to the base of the transistor, too much current would flow. I'll demonstrate this by directly connecting the microcontroller pin to the base of the transistor. When the square wave is applied, the microcontroller switches between sourcing 400 milliamps through the base or sinking the base drive current to ground, which is about 1 milliamp. To prevent this excessive current, the 400 milliamps, Let's put a diode between these two components so that the microcontroller can pull enough current from the base to turn off the transistor, but prevent too much current from flowing otherwise. Now that we can see the current flowing in and out of the microcontroller pin is about one milliamp, or zero milliamp when one milliamp isn't flowing, since pretty much every tracer wire anywhere is actually a low pass filter, the peak seen at the edges of the pulses would likely have a smaller magnitude, but 8 milliamps isn't anything I'd be concerned about anyways. What would happen if the transistor wasn't in the circuit or the base emitter junction was damaged? Then the voltage applied to that net could rise up as high as 24 volts unless the input protection diode in the microcontroller clamped it to approximately 5 volts. In reality, this would be 5 volts plus a couple diode drops. 
To prevent the microcontroller from being subjected to this stress, we will add an external clamping diode with a low forward voltage, a lower forward voltage than the internal clamping diode. This pulls that current in a fault condition through an external diode rated for handling the amount of power that we're dealing with and prevents damage to the microcontroller. By adding this external diode, we drop the current through the overvolted protection diode from one milliamp to nearly zero. Now you might be thinking that a base resistor from the microcontroller to the transistor would be able to protect the microcontroller from supplying too much current through the base of the transistor too. But unfortunately, that resistor will form a resistor divider when the microcontroller tries to pull the base of the transistor down to zero volts. That resistor would ideally be as small as possible to achieve an applied voltage at the base of the transistor somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.2 or 0.3 volts. This means the transistor would either need to be driven with less strength when it's being biased by the 24 volt rail and the transistor is on, which would require sacrificing some of the design margin built into the base drive current, driving the transistor closer to its turn on voltage near 600 milliamps, which sacrifices some of the design margin when turning off the transistor, or a bit of both. When I used a 500 ohm resistor and nominal component values, it appears to work. But verifying this circuit would operate in all operating conditions would require a fairly in-depth analysis of the components at play. This resistor also still allows 8 milliamps or so to flow into the base of the transistor when outputting a logic 1. By using a low forward voltage Schottky diode, we protect the microcontroller and only allow current to flow when required, making the components involved dissipate less power. Since we already desire an external clamping diode with a low forward voltage for when the transistor is not soldered correctly to the board, we already need to purchase some of these components. Putting an extra diode on the board will add pennies to the bomb cost and eliminate the need for a few hours of circuit analysis. This protection circuitry allows us to drive the transistor with a traditional PWM output that is hardware driven. This is ideal for our application. Alternatively, Software could pulse the pin between logic low and high impedance, but that's just pushing the problem to software. Plus, if misconfiguring the pin can damage the hardware, that isn't a solution I'll happily get on board with. I mean, I like reworking boards and replacing components as much as the next guy, but I'd rather avoid the extra work if possible. There's another type of protection that's implemented on the plant light project, and that's reverse polarity protection. This was an interesting challenge for our design. Since 30 watts is flowing through the input protection circuit, the simplest way to perform this protection is using a low forward voltage diode, such as a Schottky diode. This gets tricky since diodes are rated for a lot of current, typically, and have a higher forward voltage when they're rated for a lot of current. This means that the power dissipation in the diode will likely be a limiting factor of the design. This power is also a direct hit to the overall efficiency of the board, since all the power for the board flows through it. If there's two amps flowing through this input protection and the forward voltage is one volt, that would be two watts dissipated in the diode. The way that I kept the reverse voltage protection but increased the efficiency is by using a PMOS FET oriented such that the body diode of the FET allows current to flow at t equals zero. As current flows and the voltage on the power net increases, eventually the resistor divider at the gate of the FET turns on the FET as the turn on voltage is exceeded. This causes the channel of the FET to conduct, greatly reducing the impedance of the transistor. This impedance is the on-state resistance of the MOSFET. In the reverse voltage condition, the gate of the FET is driven to a higher voltage than the source, driving the PMOSFET off. The body diode is also reverse biased, so no current is allowed to flow. The orientation of the body diode is critical, since if the channel is not conducting but the body diode is forward biased, Current can still flow. This isn't usually critical to consider when using a MOSFET as a switch, since the typical switching circuit always reverse biases this body diode when off. However, this typical switching circuit does not protect the load from reverse current through the body diode. That said, there are other ways of performing reverse voltage protection that are even more efficient. One example of this is using a fuse and a normally reverse biased diode across the input. If a reverse voltage is applied, the diode crowbars this voltage down to a safe one for the circuit, and the fuse will blow. This fuse could be a PTC or traditional fuse, but the end result is the same. The downstream circuitry is protected. 
depending on how likely a reverse voltage condition is, how much current is expected to flow through the circuit during normal operation, and how willing you are to rework the board or replace fuses, different methods of reverse voltage protection may end up being best for your application. For the plant light project, the MOSFET acting as a switch was an acceptable form of reverse voltage protection that doesn't involve blowing fuses. Now if you think that clamping diodes are cool and this video is great, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, subscribing to the channel, and leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye!